Welcome back all, thank you for joining us. Today it's the sequel I have been looking forward to recording for a while now. I'm joined by the charming and witty Chris Norton, Egyptologist extraordinaire, to discuss his newest release, Egyptologist's Notebooks, and the so-called Golden Age of Egyptology. But was it all that golden in reality? Stay tuned to find out. This is part two of the two-part episode I recorded with Chris, so if you've missed the first half, please be sure to go back and check that out, because you will be kind of coming in halfway through the conversation, though I'm sure you'll still find value in that. Chris Norton is former director of the Egypt Exploration Society. He's appeared on the BBC and Channel 5, hosting shows covering everything from Flinders Petrie, the founding father of scientific Egyptology, to Tutankhamun, and numerous other shows, including Egypt's Unexplained Files. He's currently the director of the Robert Anderson Research Charitable Trust, a London-based charity that provides support to visiting academics. And he's the president of the International Association of Egyptologists. And on top of all that, he's written two fascinating books now. The first, Searching for the Lost Tombs of Egypt, we discussed last year. So be sure to go and check out that episode. The second we'll be digging right into today. And in the following episode, yes, this is a two-parter. So, for those of you who've been hankering for a deep dive into the world of early exploration, adventure, and groundbreaking Egyptology, well, you're in for a treat. And without further ado, I warmly welcome to the show, Dr. Chris Norton. And that's a really important point as well, because it comes back to the kind of the values of the time and the values of the day, which actually ties into a point I wanted to bring up, which is getting a bit more personal with these characters. And I like that you included this. You know, we've got people like James Burton and and others going to slave markets and uh, yeah. you know, acquiring slaves, girl slaves, and who and later marrying them, which of course is deeply problematic by today's <sighs> standards and seemingly very common back then. But what I found interesting was like in in the case of Robert Hay, for instance, his initial interest seems to be in liberating these slaves until he's told, well, that's not practical. They're all going to die if you just pay for them to be released. Yeah. 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 It's all kinds of complicated, this sort of situation. I mean, the idea of buying slave girls in the market in Cairo was clearly not something that all of these people who did that went at with great gusto. Mm. Yeah. Some, some of them clearly had reservations. And as you say, you know, there's a suggestion on the part of some that maybe it would be better to, to free them from the market but then you know then what happens and actually in several cases lane hay one or two others i think as well the the slave girls were ultimately treated in the same way notwithstanding the you know the way the relationship initially came about they were subsequently treated in the way that other women would have been in a relationship with a, with a man and, you know, and they were married and they were given, they were accorded all the same rights. It, it's, even that is kind of slightly, it's kind of slightly, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's e- I think it's easy just to say that was terrible. Mm. But it, but it is more complicated than that. And there's, mm. there were all kinds of other things going on. It's a which, thorny issue and it's very layered, isn't it? Obviously, I mean, it- yeah, there's probably best if you just shut me up at that point because I'm struggling, <laughs> I'm str- struggling to articulate. Um, oh dear, yeah. I think the important thing uh, for me with the book was just to acknowledge it and yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, and just absolutely. say, I, and I, I'm, you know, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't really investigate the, the issue thoroughly in the book, mm. but it's there, and people should understand that. And, well, and there's a research question there for somebody's PhD. You know, should should they want to get into that i suppose there's a lot of avenues you could go down just from looking at these archives and and becoming kind of slightly familiar even with the world as it was for these egyptologists i mean you've got you know hay being a contemporary of burton who showed him amana as, as you point out and then wilkinson being very aggrieved about this presumably there's some some kind of record of this or some text of this at the time where because it was wilkinson who first stumbles upon amana so to speak isn't it Yes, or at least the decorated tombs. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, yeah. So, so the boundary steely had been had been recorded in the seventeen hundreds at least, and the Napoleonic description de l'Egypte includes includes the site. But but somehow this is a very strange 
I feel like we haven't got to the bottom of this. It is supposedly John Gardner Wilkinson who was the first person to see the rock tombs. The idea that nobody would have been aware of their existence until that time seems very, very odd. And yet, if people had seen them, they could not have failed, surely, to be struck, as everybody is even today, by just how different those tombs are from 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 the other things the, you know the other monuments of, of ancient Egypt that you might see so so may maybe somehow knowledge of that among European visitors just didn't just wasn't there and to that point Hay was Hay was incredibly aggrieved that he had not been informed of this by Wilkinson until some couple of years after Wilkinson had apparently first seen them I think I forget the exact chronology but it was Wilkinson went in 1824, I think, something like that. And Hay found out from Burton in about 1827, something like that. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, that seems to be a rare example of the non-sharing of that kind of information. Mm. And it remains a bit of a mystery, I think, as far as I know, just exactly what was going on there. Because all of these people are not only personally known to one another and socializing and talking and you know discussing and exchanging information all the time but they're all also documenting everything they see with it with a with an explicit view of intention of publishing the material yeah so i mean if gardner wilkinson you can sort of understand that somebody like gardner wilkinson might have wanted to keep the discovery for himself but yeah you know it doesn't seem in the spirit of the way things were done at the time it's an out. It's an isolated example of this, to my knowledge, from this era anyway. And and on that sort of magnitude, that's such a big, such big news. It's just a mystery. Yeah, it's a mystery. But there probably was more competitiveness, maybe than we're even even between where we're very well aware of the competition between Brits, the Brits and French. Yeah. But but even among people on the same team, notionally there was perhaps more competition than we're aware of. Mm. Um, well, it's understandable, I suppose, if you're funneling resources into something which is quintessentially quite dangerous. I mean, people were dressing as taking on the appearance of Turks, as they put it, at the time. Yeah. To try and avoid hassle from the locals. I, I really get the impression that before the kind of industrialization, particularly under Muhammad Ali, that Egypt seems to be quite inhospitable just from the just from the local population's perspective as well i mean that seems to come up in a lot of instances and you know wilkinson witnessing the revolt and seeing corpses kind of being eaten by dogs by the river it, it does sound like a far from this picturesque kind of romantic idea of of early travels to egypt quite a dangerous place really where you had to carry arms and disguise yourself to a degree and i mean was that is that a fair assessment do you think of yeah i think it is it, um, that sort of thing was a was it was a bit it's a bit of a surprise to me how clearly that came across in the accounts I was reading, actually. Yeah. I hadn't really considered up until the research for this book. Yeah. Just, just what a hostile environment it was. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it, it, it's maybe easy for us to forget now that you, you can go almost anywhere in the world and there is an infrastructure for, for, for t- travel and tourism, yeah. you know, so trying to do something intrepid is very difficult now. Well, it's much harder. In no, it's not much harder. That's what I'm talking about. There's just there's just maybe fewer sort of parts of the world that where, where you can do that. You know, yeah. so certainly if you go to Egypt now, the world you know the world the world is familiar with foreigners, and you know there's a whole like I say infrastructure for this. So people up and down the Nile Valley in Egypt, Egypt will be very familiar with seeing big boats full of white tourists mm. going up and down the Nile and. And they know what happens and they know where they stop and they know what happens when they get out. And there's a whole infrastructure for this. And and that is quite a new thing. You know, that's second half of the 19th century onwards when industrial scale tourism gets going. But up until that point, uh, and I think in, I think from this point of view that the Napoleonic expedition, um, which arrived in 1798 and was pretty much done with a couple of years later, that is a watershed moment, not only in terms of the the description de l'Egypte, which the expedition produced, its its scientific study of, of Egypt, which, which is which is its great sort of academic contribution to Egyptology, but it's it's also really significant in the history of modern Egypt and what that means for Egyptology. In that, it it ushers in it ushers out the Mamluk rulers, yeah. 
ruling Egypt on behalf of the Ottoman Sultan. It ushers in Muhammad Ali, mm. who's this Albanian soldier, an Ottoman Empire soldier, who, as you say, comes to rule Egypt pretty much as an independent unit and begins this rapid modernization of the country. That, that makes it much easier for Europeans. Yeah. The Napoleonic expedition establishes institutions like the Institut d'Egypte mm. and establishes a permanent presence for Europeans there, not just, not just the French, but Europeans generally. And Muhammad Ali encourages it because he wants European skills and investment. So that makes things easier, but it's still true that for the local population, these, these foreigners are strange yeah. at the very least, quite possibly in their own minds, potentially hostile, mm. rich by comparison, mm. rich in just in, in terms of money, but also in terms of things like technology, yeah. you know, so things like guns and metal, and you know those those sorts of things survey equipment or you know drawing materials or whatever they might have had and been using all, all of this is strange and maybe sort of alluring yeah. and it's and it establishes a dynamic between the local population and the visitors which um wasn't always a very happy one yeah yeah and so there's a there's a kind of friction between the two groups i, I mean funnily enough um not strictly speaking as part of the research for this book, but when would it have been? Just before I started going on the research for this, I happened to be on holiday in South America. Mm -hmm. And while in South America, actually while on Easter Island, which is an extraordinary place to be, I started to read a book called, it's called Tree River, or River of Trees, Tree River, something like that, which is essentially a history of the European encounter with the Amazon, right. the Amazon basin in South America. Right. And I had such a, such, I found it such a profoundly interesting and useful book. And it's the story of, you know, rich, technologically advanced, blundering, incompetent Europeans crashing into an environment which is just doing perfectly fine, thank you very much, and ruining it. <laughs> <laughs> for want of a better way of putting it and this you know this story is much more complicated than than i make it seem just in in a, in a minute or so there but there are clearly parallels with with the story in in other parts of the world as well including i think egypt yeah in in that you know you've, we've got these people coming in coming crashing in with the ability to travel and explore and discover and buy things because they've got money and technology and yeah. sort of stuff, but but without n necessarily being the agreement on the part of the local population. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's there's, de there's definitely something invasive about the activity. I, I mean, that's a loaded term, certainly. But our assumption, I suppose, or the Western assumption and presumption of travelling, of being able to tour these lands is something in itself only really something we're getting to grips with these days there's a, there were a few things whilst we were kind of around still around the wilkinson kind of era that i found really interesting benny hassan preserving the tomb decorations and things like that and that's actually a question in general is that there's there's a lot of really beautiful tomb scenes in here which have been you know made during that era how do they hold up oh that's a really good question i the short answer to that is i don't know <laughs> It's difficult to say, actually, and I, I did. I was asking myself this question a few years ago when I was when I was working in the EES archives. Mm. I used to work for the EES, mm. and I was particularly interested in the facsimile copies made by people like Howard Carter at the end of the nineteenth century. And in in those, Howard Carter is in the book, and he's in the book for lots of reasons, but including because of his contribution to copying tomb decoration at Beni Hassan, yeah, and elsewhere. And I was interested to know to what extent he had been able to capture things which had subsequently been lost. And I visited those places. And to be quite honest, it's difficult to say because it's difficult to know to what extent Carter and others were, were capturing exactly what they were seeing versus, versus what 
what was there before damage, you know, before any damage came along. And, and Carter clearly, and others, clearly adopted ways of demonstrating that decorated surfaces had been damaged. But it's still difficult. It's still, I, I find not all, always very clear to, to know. Yeah, exactly what the situation is. And the other thing that's, that makes life difficult, I suppose, is that um, essentially these are, in the case of, say, the tombs of Benny Hassan, these are these are unlit rock cut, yep. pitch black, in other words, spaces. Yep. So without some kind of artificial lighting, you see nothing at all. Yep. And Carter and his team would have probably been using mirrors, candlelight, that kind of thing. Mm. The tombs these days are lit by um, fluorescent strip lights, yeah. um, which have a particularly sort of white and blue character to them. So again, it's a, you know, when you go, and I've never done a scientific study of this, I've, I've never really been able to say for sure what the difference is. Having said all this, there are cases in which there, there were clearly things on the walls at a certain point which are clearly not just altered or slightly sort of chipped here and there but mm. completely and utterly 100 percent vanished yeah so to give you another example you know there is a scene in the tomb of mary ra the first i think i always get this mixed up it's either the first or second mary ra the first i think at mano which is important for the history of the of the period because it um has a scene in the first billet hall to the right of the doorway leading through to the next chamber, a scene of a king and queen with above and to the right of those two figures, the cartouches giving us the names of the king and queen. And anybody who knows about, you know, anybody who's a student of the Amman period will know that the names, the name of the king is Smenkare and Kepri Re Smenkare, and the queen is married Aten, the eldest daughter of Akhenaten, unambiguously. Norman de Garris Davis, who was copying the tomb decoration for the EEF at the beginning of the 20th century, noted that it was that it was impossible to see those cartouches at, at his time. And in fact, he's very good at documenting the deterioration of, of individual scenes at Amano. So, you know, Lepsius saw this, but now it's impossible, or Hay saw this. And in, right. in fact, in the case of the Mary Ra scene, both Lepsius and Hay were able to copy at least parts of the the cartouches hay seems to have not been entirely sure what he was looking at the lepsius mm -hmm. expedition seemed to be able to absolutely see what the cartouches said people have been arguing about whether they really saw what they were they thought they were seeing and we yeah. will never know yeah. i went to this tomb myself a couple of years ago and i mean i didn't do it with scientific lighting and all the equipment and any other technical stuff i just went with it a torch and you know the, there's the lighting that's in 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 the tomb you can't see anything now, nothing at all. Not just the car, you not just the cartouches, but you can't see the figures. You can't see anything. Wow. It's like a blank wall. Wow. So, so yeah. I mean, there are lots of examples. Sadly, I mean, far too many to document where these things have deteriorated in the last two centuries. Um, it's really fascinating, though, to know that there are contemporary accounts from that period where certain travellers are only going a decade or two later and noting that oh, that. That thing's gone, you know. Or that's yeah. Well. That that is one of I. That is the most profound thing for me in in all of this is. And I was trying to explain this to um, a friend of mine the other day. I think the thing is that, to some extent, I have started from the assumption, and maybe I'm not the only one, that the that basically with archaeology, what happens is some point in the past there's a thing a building yeah. and then over time it falls into ruin or it becomes concealed and then and then there's archaeology and archaeology comes along and reveals it reveals what's physically left and maybe virtually sort of reconstructs it somehow mm -hmm. and that and, and then we all live happily ever after and and actually what this what we you know what, what all these drawings and the things we're talking about here show is that the first parts of that are true. So you have something which is built, a build, a building gets built yeah. or a painting gets painted and then it slowly sort of decays and maybe disappears completely from view or disappears from sort of knowledge. And then archeology span comes along and reveals it. But what happens is we don't actually live happily ever after. Mm. 
you know, the process sort of continues. So things get lost again. Yeah. And as you say, it's really sort of, it's really quite shocking, I think, how many serious sort of standing monuments that were visible at the beginning of the 19th century had completely disappeared within 10 or 20 years, either through natural causes in one or two cases, but more likely than not, because the stone had been taken away from other buildings. It's also true, of course, that in the case less so of temple buildings, I can't think of too many examples of archaeologists or Egyptologists or people involved in that sort of thing removing standing monuments. Mm. But it did happen. So the obelisk is, that's in the Place de la Concorde mm. in Paris now was absolutely standing where it was originally erected in front of the Luxor Temple. And the obelisk that's in Central Park in New York, which is still standing, was removed, you know, blah, blah, even if the rest of the building had gone. But in, in, the, case of, in the case of tombs in particular, it was a thing to acquire a chunk of tomb painting. Yep. So these were hacked out of the walls, sometimes by the kinds of people who we celebrate in this book. Mm. And... In, uh, there's a great passage I'm very fond of relating to the story of Frédéric Caillot, who's a French uh, Egyptologist, copyist, the, the, one of the very first to identify the ancient city of Meroe in Sudan. Yes. He copied a number of paintings and tombs, and one of, one of the tombs that he copied quite the decoration quite extensively on is a tomb of a man called Neferhotep, which is somewhere in the Theban hills. I say somewhere because... The precise location is now lost mm. and his paintings show this tomb to have been very beautifully decorated so you know what you know he painted it in the 1820s now it's lost are you serious yes it is and a chunk of that still exists in the louvre because Cayo removed it wow and uh, and yanni got another character called yanni dathanese giovanni dathanese dathanazi who was in Italian, but operating on behalf of Henry Salt, the British Consul General, mm -hmm. writes at a certain point how disgusted he is with Cayo for this. And he had given Cayo permission to enter the tomb of Neferhotep to make copies, yeah. but he didn't give him permission to remove any part of the wall. And he is absolutely livid and incensed beyond, you know, beyond anything at Cayo's awful behaviour. Thing is, it's absolutely clear that Daphnesi was doing exactly the same thing in other places. <laughs> so, for example, arguably the finest tomb paintings to have survived from ancient Egypt are the paintings from the tomb of Neb Amun, which are now on display in the British Museum mm. in a gallery all of their own. And indeed, they are exceptionally fine paintings. And those also come from a tomb whose, um, <laughs> whose location is now lost to us. And they were removed by Yanni Daphnesi yeah. in order that they could go to the British Museum essentially mm. well in order that they could go into the collection of henry salt and you know events into the that, british museum so that brings me to another question i wanted to ask actually with respect to these notes it strikes me that is there an opportunity there to try to relocate some of this stuff which has subsequently been lost are, are there hints in any of their stories or their accounts or anything which might help us locate with reference to sites that we know perhaps or geographical features that we might be able to figure that that's, out. That's a really, yeah, that's a really good question. So one of the problems, I suppose, with, and one of the things that we, should, we could regret mm. is that at, at the time these things were being hacked out of the walls, it, just as with Belzoni excavating Karnak willy-nilly and taking things out of the ground without really documenting exactly where they were found or what the relationship of one thing to the other was. This work was being done in the Theban necropolis without any geographical framework yeah. onto which to pin the data. Yeah. So Hay and Gardner Wilkinson, for example, both produced actually very fine and very detailed topographical maps of the West Bank at Thebes and Hayes is in the book, actually. But there are just far too many yeah. of these tombs to try and to plot onto a single map. And so to my knowledge, nobody ever really even attempted it. 
there was also no numbering system. This is really key as well. Mm. Yes. There's no numbering system for Theban tombs. Not that it was in consistently in use anyway. Yeah. That doesn't come until the beginning of the 20th century. It's, it's Alan Gardner and Arthur, Arthur Weigel's efforts mm -hmm. that we have to thank for imposing a systematic numbering system yeah. onto the Theban tombs. And it, that kind of makes you realise that the extent to which Egyptology is an, is an intellectual abstract con concept, if you like. Yeah. When, and we're dependent on that to, to sort of organise our knowledge and understanding, yeah. given, given that we have no control over the physical sites yeah. or, you know, we haven't been able to control that. So things can get lost. Things can not only not continue to exist in a certain place but we just don't even know where they came from yeah, yeah. which just seems you know for, for for people like you and i who are you know absolutely trained in this whole these systems mm. of, of of gathering and building sort of information systems it's it's really unsettling to think yeah. you know hang on we do, what do you mean they visited it and they documented it and they drew it and we don't even know where it was are you kidding me <laughs> It's just too, it's, 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 um, it's staggering, isn't it? Yeah, it is staggering. Yeah. But attempts have been made to do exactly as you say. Yeah. So for example, some of these tombs, which are lost were given numbers by people like Hay. Mm -hmm. So a number of tombs that Hay visited, whose owners can be identified because the inscriptions can be read in Hay's drawings. And the same goes for others, Burton, Cayo, Etc. Right. Etc. So you right. can identify the owners. There might be other little bits and pieces of information which would allow you to kind of cross-reference things, so that Burton's, you know, tomb number fourteen is actually Hayes number six, right. you know, which is now lost. Yeah. There's a definitive list of numbered tombs according to the Gardner and Weigel sequence, which is published in the Porter Moss topographical bibliography of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic text release and paintings, volume 1.1. And that includes reference to all of the Hay, Burton, Wilkinson, Cayo, et cetera, archives as right. everything that they could get access to. Right. So that is, the, that is, although it was done retrospectively at a time when a lot of these terms had been lost, that's, that was a draw the line under everything. This is all the information we've got. Yep. Subsequent to that, Friederike Camp, published a sort of enhanced version of that in the 90s which took the number of of numbered and documented tombs from somewhere in the 600s to well into the thousands that's for thebes only that's for the wow. theban necropolis only and it included tombs now i forget if portion moss does or not i think it probably does includes tombs now lost that only exist in documentation Wow. And add to that, Lisa Manike published two two volumes on the on, on attempting to relocate 18th dynasty and 19th dynasty tombs. The, all of this really interests me because I'm, I'm interested in the sketches, I'm interested in the people, I'm interested in lost things, yep. things you know, this whole phenomenon of things lost, being lost tombs things. in Egypt. Example, hey, guess guess what? Right, guess point. what? Right, thank you. <laughs> guess what? I got in touch with Lisa Manike not very long ago about this actually to to say. Because the other thing is, thank you for being so patient. Not uh, at all. The, the, other, the, the other thing is, excavations are ongoing yeah. in the theme in the Acropolis, and new tombs are being found all the time. Right. And so I just pinged Lisa an email earlier this year, actually, during lockdown. Just notebooks is finished by this point so just for my own curiosity the tombs that have been discovered in the last few years are any of them our missing hay etc tombs that were visited in the, in the 19th century and short answer is yes some of them are she hasn't been able to do a detailed study yet but yes so some of those things are going to turn up on the ground some of them will be it will be not possible to identify almost yeah. certainly but yeah, there's some there's some hope, and in terms of in terms of other monuments, I'm just about to. I keep the more I keep mentioning this to people, the more pressure I put on myself to actually get it done. I'm about to publish a, a blog post on a monument in Alexandria which has been lost. Yes, I remember you mentioning this actually. The interview with Curtis. Yes, I did. Yeah, it's watching that's, Chris. No pressure. Yeah, <laughs> that's what that's what I mean. I keep saying this. To, 
as if nobody's listening yeah so that 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 is coming and actually i was just looking also at a, again thanks for your patience here you can edit me out no, I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry all the time about all the time if you lost today, but, <laughs> I, but you can edit this out for the podcast here. I was just looking at the lost temple of Antiopolis, which is in the region of Gao El Kabir in, in, in Upper Egypt. Mm -hmm. It's a Ptolemaic temple which consisted of something like 18 columns. There's a beautiful drawing of it in the description of the Egypt. Belzoni was aware of its existence and visited in about 1817, only to find that only one of the columns was still standing. Out of wow. 18. So the description de l'Egypte saw this like beautiful Ptolemaic temple right by the river. And that's significant because it turns out that the river had it had it eventually started to lap up too close to the, the temple and had, cl had clearly undermined it. And and right. and by 18, I've got a note that says by 1821, it had completely gone, completely washed away. But I was just looking at a satellite image the other day of the general area comparing with a an archaeology, archaeological map mm. from actually from Porter and Moss from the topographical bibliography from a long time after the temple would have gone, but still showing the general area. Yeah. And just from the position of the river and the position of a couple of roads, it was possible to sort of see it looks like the temple was probably here. And in the exact location where the temple should have been, there's a village, which is quite striking in the satellite image because it's an agricultural area. So you've just got green fields everywhere. Mm. And then in this particular place where it looks like the temple should have been, there's a, there's a village. And the village is called Naga El Jazeera. And El Jazeera means an island. Yep. So I just thought, you know, how, how did that get its name? Maybe it was an island. And what are the chances that the temple was built on an island? We know the Egyptians were doing that kind of thing. So I suspect that actually the location of that temple is still visible. It's just that you need to know a little bit about sort of landscape dynamics and the way that things yeah. work. I, I mean, and I don't, I don't know this, and I also don't know if any of the stonework is still there. But it's got to be somewhere. It's got it's to be somewhere, even if it's incorporated into that the buildings of that village, which wasn't an unusual practice. Yeah, I, I just, I just wonder. You know, maybe, uh, maybe there's somebody in the local Minister of Antiquities who would just tell you, oh yeah, we know all about this. Yeah. Mm. Old news, not interesting. But for me, you know, I mean, well, if, it, if it turned out there was a there was a, like a massive column just yeah underpinning somebody's house, I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I mean, that that actually uh, that does it brings me to another question. I don't I don't want to overstay my welcome and keep you too long. I'm sorry about that. But the maps there is there are a number of topographical maps in this book and in, in these you know field journals, so to speak. Some of them done by actual cartographers or you know people with some skill. How do those maps hold up? now well yeah that's another really good question i get i guess it varies that's that's one that's one way of um of putting it yeah otherwise though i my sense and i ha i can't tell you that i have i've looked into this too too much mm. my sense is that they're quite good so and I, again this is maybe this is i'm not maybe the quite the right the right person to answer this question but or the, you know to deal with this idea but my sense is that surveying the sort of art of sur survey plotting points onto a topographical map was ahead of other other branches of or other other skills and sciences that egyptology could draw on yeah so it's absolutely clear and this is something that i would know a little bit more about that standards of epigraphy copying inscriptions were you know down here at the beginning of the 19th century and right up here at the end of the 19th century. Survey, I suspect, had already got quite good mm. by the time of the Napoleonic expedition. So by way of sort of answering the question, the, the topographical map of the ruins of Amarna mm -hmm. or the ruins of Antinoopolis, very close to Amarna, also in the Description de l'Egypte, seem to be quite good to me. Yeah. And actually, if you compare with the maps that are in the Denkmäler, the publication of Carl Richard Lepsis's Prussian expedition of the 1840s, they're very much comparable. And again, the sort of level of detail in terms of the natural environment, the natural landscape and the position of monuments in the John Gardner Wilkinson and Robert Hay maps of the Theban Necropolis. Yeah. You know, I can't tell you that I can't tell you that I've gone and kind of, you know, done a 
AO size print of that and got a satellite map and compared the measurements and distances mm-hmm. and to check for accuracy. But they look pretty good to me. Mm. What's just what's yeah, well, I mean where 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 things become tricky is that of course just much more has been revealed. Mm. And you know, like I was saying in the case of the Theban Acropolis maps, the the detail wasn't there. So, yeah, I, 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 my sense is that they're pretty good. There's not, there, there aren't, where people were making maps, they did it pretty well. Mm. Well, they've been, you know, making maps for relatively, relatively accurate maps for quite some time by this point in time as well, simply because of trade, because of military expeditions, because of exploration unto itself, having been an enterprise for centuries before Egyptology even begins. I suppose, yes, it, it makes sense that that science and art, as it were, would be quite well developed, even where other methodologies hadn't been developed. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. Yeah. And thinking, you know, I, I found it very instructive to to study Pascal Cost, mm, for example, yeah. who who is yeah. in the book. He's not really an Egyptologist. He was an architect. Yeah. But he makes a contribution to Egyptology by copying things and making notes and visiting sites. Maps um, as well. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. His maps are very good, but then he was he was responsible for things like the construction of the Mahmudia Canal, mm. which connects Alexandria with the Rosetta branch of the Niles. So that's a construction project that plays out over miles and miles and miles. Yeah. And obviously, you couldn't you couldn't have done anything like that without a good sense of geography and an ability to survey territory and make maps. Yeah. So exactly as you say, yeah, I guess these are these are skills which have de- been developed for other purposes, but were well developed when Egyptology needed them. And speaking of, I mean, I, I think I'll probably just uh, do a highlight reel now of some of the things that stood out to me. You obviously, you cover some of the more famous names, as you rightly mentioned, kind of Champollion is in there and his enormous contribution. But I also like that there's a nod to kind of Wilkinson's serious amount of hieroglyphical knowledge the fact that he could occasionally challenge champollion's interpretations and that i found very fascinating because i hadn't really associated him with that before so that was really interesting and uh, like you say you know lepsius and howard carter and all that are in there a few of the names which really struck me as i was going through just to do like a, a hit list as well of some of the lesser knowns hekekian mid 19th century absolutely fascinating i mean we've got a geologist specializing in deposition this is the first archaeologist really scientific archaeology that we're seeing in the record and he's doing it in Heliopolis and and Memphis it's a name I'd been familiar with because I studied under David Jeffries back in the day obviously and Hekekian is a big big pet interest of Jeffries but you know the the centerpiece in the book I I got such a kick out of the fact that the centerpiece in the book was a giant pullout stratigraphy map it's, it's yeah. a really bold choice you know yeah rather than a picture of king tut we've got that well, that is the decision of an archaeologist surely well no i was good no actually all credit to my colleagues at thames and hudson um, yeah that was their call yeah really it's bold yeah yeah I, I mean you know look my 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 job like i say was to sort of come up with the initial concept and and write the text and yeah, I mean, it never occurs to me that we could we could have foldouts. I know enough from from working for the ES to yep. know about. I know enough about publishing to know how expensive it is to do that kind of thing, and therefore, and and it's prohibitive most of the time. That's why you don't have foldouts most of the time in books because it's just too expensive to do it. But but the 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 team were all very clear from the beginning that they they wanted images. They they wanted a good number of images which in some way conveyed the process of gathering information and the sort of the thought processes if you like and the yep. thing about Hekekian's drawings is they're huge mm. uh, they are full of information mm. he uses every last square inch of available paper so there might be a central image but then you know as you know that in the yeah. sort of what might be the margins he's then He's then got a whole load of text and another drawing, and then along the sides there's another drawing, and that I think for the guys at Thames and Hudson, without, and these are not Egyptologists, they're people who know a little bit about Egyptology, but they're not Egyptologists or archaeologists as such. 
just from the purely visual point of view of what it suggested about Hekekian and his work yeah. and his way of working and the kind of data he was gathering it seemed to them to be the perfect representation of of a process of the of the thoughts behind gathering archaeological information and and they were bang on absolutely bang on and and it was it was a perfect choice there i mean there were other large drawings that we could have incorporated and, and put onto a fold out but i think it was perfect in so many ways in that he's not a very well-known character in the field joseph kekian yep. he was he was doing things that were decades ahead of his time yeah. that's probably partly why he's not better known because i think people didn't know what to do with the kind of information he gathered for for decades and and they and they and you know he's still underappreciated today so even though david jeffries who you mentioned who's really the person more than anybody else responsible for bringing an understanding and awareness of hekekian's work and importance to to modern scholarship his volume on hekekian because of the constraints of publishing doesn't include so many so many drawings certainly not in color as you might as you might hope for mm. so you know david's david's book is far far superior to, to mine in detail and interpretation and that sort of thing but but we we've you know i'd like to think sort of plugged a little bit of a gap in that yeah. in that it's now possible to to see a representative sample of those drawings in something approaching their full glory yeah um, yeah which is great yeah it really is it really is and i love that you've got you kind of went out of your way to try and include these voices i mean I, I come next to amelia edwards obviously a thousand miles up the nile founds the eef which becomes the ees which you were director of of course for several years and you know quite a, a striking description of the abundance of remains of both human ceramic and stone or lithographic etc cetera, etc cetera. a really interesting account and recently discovered an original album of her artwork of watercolors yeah i mean that that kind of thing that was a gift to this yeah. project i just happened to know although we've never met i just happened to know via social media william joy he's who is with his mother peggy joy he curates a library of Egyptological literature and an, and an archive that includes letters, drawings, exactly the kind of material that, that we might have wanted to include. It's an Egyptology library, yep. Peggy Joy Egyptology library. And William is just the most generous um, person in offering up information and in, and in this case material. So I knew actually from before Egyptologist Notebooks was a, was a project, was underway, that he had come across, thanks to his his own f f wonderful research, this album of, of coloured drawings, which Amelia had made in Egypt. And she only went once. I mean, it was a landmark trip because of yeah. everything that came after it, but yeah. she only went the once. And uh, yeah, and and although, you know, some of, his, uh, some of her drawings are very well known and she herself is quite well known, her story is quite well known. This was a, here he was a, here was an album of her drawings made in Egypt, which the world knew nothing about. And William found it, was able to was able to bring it into the, the Peggy Joy Egyptology Library and to make it available to this book, which, like I say, it's just I would never have I would never have imagined that, you know, we'd be able to do anything like that in this yeah. book. But it means that, uh, yeah, it means that we've been able, thanks to William's efforts and generosity to to make these images more widely available mm. yeah and so uh, yeah and, and so that it, it, you know there are there are plenty of characters in the book who who are not very well known and whose archives are not very well known and so from that point of view in some sense it was easy to you know to, to sort of identify material that would that would tick all the boxes you know not yeah. terribly well known never published before in the case of Amelia who was always going to get into the book because because of her importance to the story most most importantly but, but also because you know she worked in a visual way with her drawings mm. but, but you know the, and i have a personal connection through the es but but I, but honestly i mean it, it were not for this i would have been thinking well i mean I, you know how are we going to find anything that people haven't seen before i think we're just going to have to accept that we do the section and there will be a lot of people reading this who say yeah well of course that's not new to me but you know like i say thanks to william 
new material. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. There was, a, there was a couple of things that really stood out in that section as well, which I loved. One was the quote that you included, which is, when science leads the way, is it wonderful that ignorance should follow when she's lamenting the defacement and destruction that's mm -hmm. happening mm -hmm. as she's there on the ground? Yeah, she's yeah. witnessing and inspiring her to to actually you know create that the first chair in egyptian archaeology in the uk and establish egyptology as a as a proper subject so to speak which which can't be you know they can't be undersold so to speak as as to its importance and there's also wonderful little quotes in there like the the quote you have from andrew mccullum i have found the entrance to a tomb please send some sandwiches <laughs> yeah 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 that yeah, that is an extraordinary moment <laughs> re recorded in Amelia's account of, of of the discovery of what turns out to be a little shrine of Ramses mm. II at Abbey Simmel. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, again, I, I I actually in my original drafts for this book had far more quotes than ultimately made it into the book. Mm. And uh, again, if we if we'd included everything that I had in my first draft, then the book would have been twice as long and twice as expensive, and nobody would have bought it, and that would have been the end of the whole thing. But but I, the reason for mentioning that is just to say that you know I there were so many occasions when I was reading these accounts when I I just thought there's no point in me there's no point in me saying what they said you know mm. and now Hay said this thing or yeah you know, there's no, no point in me trying to describe it much better to just let let these people speak for themselves you know Amelia, Amelia describes what happened in the in in the beautiful language of the late 19th century and the you know where she wrote her account yeah. it doesn't need me to come along and you know reduce the whole thing to you know language that has no character and <laughs> you know and everything so so from that point of view you know it's again it's kind of a kind of a gift I I love to I love to read these things and yeah, yeah. I, I, I hope, I hope people might be inspired to go and read something like a thousand miles up the, up the Nile, Amelia's account of her of her travels as a result of of you know reading this book maybe because it, it really it's it, it's it really would reward uh, the reader with loads more of that kind of thing. Yeah, it's, as I say, that even though there is sometimes a sense of loss, it's also a, a fascinating window through time, in a sense. It's a, it's a window to another time, and and these. Mm. Journals very much operate as that, and they they reinforce, I think, the the very human worlds and the size of those worlds, how particularly small some of those person worlds are. But particularly with like people like you know an, another one of these voices that I'm really glad you included, Marianne Brucklehurst, you know, finder of antiquities, but consulted the the infamous uh, Rasul family, who you know were famous for kind of finding or looting the Deir el Bahari New Kingdom cash, money cash. The fact that you have people crossing over in those worlds, communicating with each other, aware of each other, it really brings this this whole area to light. And the, the last honourable mention would, of course, be Hassan Effendi Hosni, one of the seven graduates of the Egyptian School of Egyptology. Which I, re I really like that you um, included that because you've got Ahmed Kamal, who was later assistant curator at the Bulak Museum, which in itself has a fascinating story. You could write a volume on the Bulak, you know, without question. I think. So yeah, yeah lost lost generation, as you put it, a lost generation of of Arabic Egyptologists, whom I know that there, you know, there's there's books like the Missing Millennium, the Kashar al Daily's work has has kind of highlighted some of this stuff. I would love to see, I'd love to see a sequel actually from you, and I hope that that is potentially on the map. What is next for Chris Norton? Very quickly. I, I don't know. I, I don't know, actually. Yeah, I don't know. I I've got I've got a few ideas. I mean, I'm doing I'm doing plenty of online lectures at the moment while while I can't travel. As soon as travel becomes possible again, I'll be back working with hopefully with TV companies and with tour companies. I would really like to think that there will be another book, <laughs> but yeah, I, I as you know, you know. Writing a book and publishing a book are different things, and I need to find a project which which somebody will be prepared to publish. <laughs> I and I don't, I don't <laughs> quite know what that is yet. So, yeah, I've got a few ideas. And notebooks has been, but both of my last, both the last two books have, have have been really great for taking me to places that I wasn't expecting to go in my research, and to places which I couldn't explore thoroughly within the confines of those two projects, but which are, you know, the potential 
opportunities for other projects. Yeah. But I, yeah, I just, I just don't know. I, hopefully a book, you know, yeah. couple of, ask me again in two years. And if I still oh. don't know, then, then I will have probably had to go back to Sainsbury's to stack shelves by then. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Humble origins. <laughs> we, we may all end up stacking shelves in Sainsbury's if <laughs> it's going the way it has. But um, I, I see that you are hoping to do another tour um, next autumn, autumn 2021 to Egypt. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually I'm actually due to I was yeah I'm actually due to go in May on a, a Nile cruise which was due to happen in uh, sorry April uh, this year April 2020 which obviously couldn't happen yep. for obvious reasons it was it was put back by a year so that is all systems go provided the situation allows it and the yeah thinking further ahead I I, I mean it's been my routine for the last few years that. Generally speaking, I would have one or two tours to do, which would which would bring me out to Egypt or Sudan, or in fact Ethiopia is in the schedule as well. A couple, of, a couple in the spring, a couple of in the autumn. So I was actually, yeah, I, I, a new one has been put into the itinerary by the company that I work with, Ancient World Tours. Other tour companies are available for for autumn, just so that there was something there, and as a kind of optimistic, you know, yeah, uh, no. And it's funny, I, I was quite surprised by how what a nice feeling it was to think that maybe it would be possible and mm -hmm. i popped this up on social media and the reaction was really great and i i guess lots of people were sort of while knowing that it might not happen you know also just happy to think that it might and and i was pleased when i went to my website to see that actually i've got four tours lined up again who knows whether any of them were but uh, fingers crossed yeah. Yep, fingers crossed indeed. And one day I'm hoping to get to come along with you on one of those money allowing. Yeah, that would, that would be fun. That would be loads of fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll be in the bar of the Winter Palace. Yeah, even if we don't do any Egyptology. So. <laughs> I, something tells me that we wouldn't be able to help but talk shop. But Yeah, I think yeah. you're probably right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. Well, Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being super generous with your time and coming on to talk about Egyptologist notebooks and all the other wonderful things we've managed to catch. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Well, thanks for your time too. And thanks for the invitation. It's great. Um, My pleasure. My yeah. pleasure. Thanks, man. And that's all we have time for today. But I wanted to thank Chris again for his generosity and Thames and Hudson for the review copy of the book. If you fancy heading to Egypt with Dr. Chris, he runs uh, mostly annual tours, COVID allowing. So check out his website, chrisnaunton.com. Links in the description for more details, and I urge you to pick up his books, Searching for the Lost Tombs of Egypt and Egyptologist's Notebooks. And in case you missed it, Chris and I both appear on the show Egypt's Unexplained Files over on Discovery Science Channel. It debuted last year, but I'm pretty certain you can catch fairly regular reruns of that. And let me know what you thought of it in the comments, because I haven't really seen it. As ever, be sure to check out the other part of this two-part interview and check back in for some exciting episodes coming up. I have Spartacus and Nightfall's Simon Merrill's incoming. As ever, I've been Paul Harrison. Thanks for listening.